Hello. Welcome back, everyone. In answer to the question, Cleveland, really? Yes, really. Yes, right? Oh, my God. Our hosts have outdone themselves, and our conference organizers have taken us on a deep dive, and we're coming up with amazing moments to take home. I was a mess yesterday during the story core plenary. Right? Oh my God. I mean, I watch a play and perhaps at the end I will have an emotional experience. Perhaps not. Uh, but in just two minutes, I was suddenly having a cathartic experience because the voices were authentic and I related in such an unfiltered way. It was a real lesson in storytelling as was my session with the ball of energy and wisdom that is Paula Vogel. That was great. With all the tragedy that has unfolded in the last year and this week, I have to believe, like John I say, in the hope that, is the, that comes from the human spirit and believe that we will come together as a people to say we are not that country and we must do it soon. One of the values that I share deeply with TCG is activism, a generosity of spirit that appeals to our better selves. It has been the underlying agenda throughout and I'd really like to, uh, to thank our brilliant, brilliant staff. And I'd like to acknowledge the members of the TCG board who has supported our staff and thank them for their, ser their service. Could you all stand, please? Stand, lights, let's see them. Thank you so much. I have an action item for you all, and you can help us with it in the next few days. The NEA funding will likely go to the floor this week, and there is a good possibility there will be a hostile amendment to decrease funding. So please, please respond to action alerts that will come to you in the next week and urge your members of Congress to oppose these moves and to hold the line on NEA funding. So please. And now, I'd like to introduce my friend, an exquisite writer, performer, activist, and all-around cool dude with an enviable name who will give out the Theater Practitioner Award, Mr. Will Power. When our children and our leaders and our elders are being murdered in the streets and in our churches, the immense body of work that this person has created and is still creating becomes more vital than ever. Through her legendary solo performances, through her directing and producing, through her leadership, she has had a profound impact on the arts. And through her artistry, she has sparked essential conversations and created bold action against injustices that occur in this place we call home. For almost 40 years, she has, had, she has been performing, touring, and adding her critical voice to the American arts movements of the 1970s, I'm going back, y'all, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Her Medea project, which works with incarcerated women through theater, inspiring and encouraging them to tell their stories, thus building bridges amongst separated communities and healing the storyteller along the way, has become an iconic institution unto itself and has drastically changed the entire culture of the Bay Area for the good. 
Now she is taking the project to South Africa and other places, working to help empower and give voice to oppressed women across the globe. What's more, her artistry has inspired and influenced a generation of playwrights, spoken word artists, and social justice workers, including me. Over 25 years ago in a black box in the Tenderloin, I saw her perform her mesmerizing solo work, Big Butt Girls, Hard-Headed Women. Yeah. And, and sitting there, I thought to myself, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> Eight years later, she was directing and teaching me as I created my first solo work that put me on the national stage for the first time. I have learned and continue to learn so much from her about performing and writing, as well as how to be a sustainable artist in America. Just last year, she directed me and several others in a piece called Blessing the Boats at the Public Theater in New York. And after all this time, I'm still learning from her and still saying to myself, maybe one day I could be half as good as her. Maybe I could be the her for my generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the great Rodessa Jones. Thank you, thank you, Will Power. Thank you so much. Oh my God, for those powerful words. You know, just my mother used to say, "You better walk right because you're gonna be walking in the light, and everybody gonna see." So thank you, Will. Thank you so much, and I forget how much I've done. Just thank you. <laughs> I'm an old broad, come on, I'm an old broad, I forget a lot, okay? <laughs> uh, big thanks to Teresa Eyring for just handing me this honor and for the hardworking staff at TCG, Emilia, Daphina, Annabelle, and Matthew, to name a few, and I'm honored to receive the Theater Practitioners Award. You know, theater saved my life. Theater saved my life. And I still wonder, well, what does it all mean? Who is art for? And where do we all enter? It was Martha Graham who said, people from California believe anything's possible. I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix cautioned me, it gets a little lonely on down this road, he sang. Yet it was Bob Marley who insisted, instructed, stay alive. I was sent to explore the autobiography, starting with my own life, my own family, gathering around the proverbial campfire to share, demand, and resign the American character, insisting on a place at the table, telling the truth, and teaching goodness is the price of the ticket. Of course, let's not forget Hunter Thompson, who reminds us, you buy the ticket and you take the ride. <laughs> what a ride it's been. Life is a dream inside of a dream, ladies and gentlemen, and Bob Dylan promised, I'll let you be in my dream if I can be in your dream. So we gather here as theater artists to celebrate that. And I must thank the folks that God gave me, starting with Idris Akamore, the executive director he would love this. The Executive Director of Cultural Odyssey. My partner in crime who encouraged me to quit my day job and make my life as an artist work, he'd say. Quit your day job. We began to make theater in his living room. He loved performing and he loved my stories. We put the words and the music together, spiced with the politics that danced and performance music was born. 
We traveled the world, Amsterdam, to Vienna, to Berlin, to Moscow, South Africa, and back. And then America beckoned. I was sent into the dark dankness of prisons where I taught the art of storytelling, bearing witness, testifying, and exploring ways that speak to the hard truths of our lives. And it's been so romantic. It's been romantic, yes. Life affirming and ennobling as well. Working with women in lockdown across the world, assisting and giving them a voice to share their stories has been priceless. And the Medea Project, Theater for Incarcerated Women was born and continues to thrive to this day, 25 years later. And all my love to my daughter, Sandra Lee, and my granddaughter, Chaz Nicole, who've always been there to remind me that mom, grandma, you have a full, rich life. And to my brother, Bill, who said, if we can't share love, let's share information. And big love to my big brother, Azel, who assured me that even in our dreams, we are alone, sis. And it was my father who said, it's a damn poor dog that can't wag its own tail, little girl. <laughs> Daddy also taught me that the heart is its own compass, and all you got to do is listen, honey. And my sister, Jahari, that ancient voice who tells me over and over again that, girl, God is trying to tell you something, Ro. All the above advice has helped shape my theater and gave light to my dreamscape. And so here this afternoon, I thank TCG, who has been one of those elements in my life that has kept the light on on earth, given me a path home. Thank you, TCG, so much for this honor. Thank you, Will Power. Thank you to all of you all. And remember, politics don't work. Religion is a bit too eclectic. But art, art could be that parachute that catches us all. Thank you very much. Thank you for the sauna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get our picture taken real quick, OK? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rodessa for your words and also for all of your work uh, leading this field forward. It's now my pleasure to introduce our closing plenary panel, Artistic Leadership, How We Change the Game. We created this panel because we wanted to talk about the game-changing power of theater through a conversation among five visionary artistic leaders. Through that conversation, we will not only be inspired by their artistry, but discover opportunities for collective action to address challenges facing our theater field and the world. How can we create a better world for theater and a better world because of theater? Please join me in welcoming Gregory Boyd from the Alley Theater in Houston, Michael Kahn from the Shakespeare Theater Company in DC, hometown hero Laura Kepley from the Cleveland Playhouse, <laughs> Mina Morita from Crowded Fire Theater in San Francisco, <laughs> Nigel Smith from the Flea Theater in Manhattan, and our moderator, Mr. Jim O'Quinn. Well, welcome to the final stretch here in this remarkable conference. You know, I can't compete with David Hawkinson and uh, Woody King. I wasn't around for the very first TCG conference, but it seems to me that uh, Terry Nimeth and I, who joined TCG at about the, almost precisely the same time back in 1982, have been to far more than 25 of these. I just can't imagine that's all their, their work. <laughs> but uh, the, the truth is that there hasn't been one of them that, uh, that I can remember that produced as many good laughs. And uh, considering the, the session yesterday, uh, a measure of tears as well. Um, as this conference has. But um, this session that we have here today, which is uh, about groundbreaking artistic leadership, I can't imagine that it's going to produce many laughs or tears. We'll see. We'll see what. But, uh, but I think it will bring together a lot of the ideas and things you've been thinking about and talking about over the past uh, three days. You, I'm going to give very brief introductions of these, these folks, these artistic leaders. Some of them uh, are uh, veterans, and some of them are brand new. 
Um, but they've been handed the task of talking about productions, people, initiatives that have changed the game in their theaters and their careers. Um, to, my, to my left uh, is Mina Morita, who is artistic director of Crowded Fire Theater in San Francisco. She's uh, made the rounds in her, her hometown. She's worked at uh, Berkeley Rep with their ground floor project, which I'm sure she'll talk about. She's been a freelance director at Shotgun Players, Bay Area Children's, Bay Area Children's Theater, and other uh, places. To her left is a man who needs no introduction at this uh, conference, but I will say that Michael Cott has been artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater Company in Washington, D.C. for the past 29 years. During that time, he's uh, uh, been handed the 2012 Regional Theater Tony for his work there. Uh, he teaches at the Drama Division of Juilliard. Uh, since its founding in 1968, he's a legend in his own time. Beside him is uh, Gregory Boyd, a representative of the same generation who has been, he's celebrating his 25th anniversary at the Alley Theater in Houston, uh, where he's produced over 100 uh, productions of a wide-ranging repertoire. Um, he teaches too. He's been at Carnegie Mellon, Williams College, University of Houston, and the University of North Carolina. Uh, beside him is a fellow I just met, um, <laughs> Nigel Smith, the brand new artistic director of a remarkable company in New York called the Flea Theater, which is organized differently than almost any other theater in the country that I know of. He'll be telling you a lot about that. Uh, Nigel uh, has just, he is talking about making the rounds. He's worked at an incredible number of venues in New York City. Uh, he works with the great Taylor Mac. He, uh, uh, his little bio, I noticed, had listed him as assistant director on three of my favorite productions from the last decade. Uh, which I have to mention, the wonderful production of Fila that was on Broadway, the off-Broadway production of a delightful play, the 25th annual Putnam County Spell Spelling Bee, which was a fabulous production, and then he worked with Tony Kushner on the masterwork, Carolina Change. So, for goodness sake, what a record. <laughs> uh, just great. Uh, r filling out our, our panel on the far left and bringing us home to the... Um, to the city that we've been experiencing this week um, is Laura Kepley, the artistic director of Cleveland Playhouse. Uh, she's a busy director who came uh, to Cleveland in 2010 uh, as associate artistic director coming from uh, Trinity Rep in Providence. I uh, have to mention that uh, Laura worked on the development of a, uh, just a uh, plug here, uh, a wonderful play, Jordan Harrison's uh, Marjorie Prime, which appears complete in the next issue of American Theatre Magazine. <laughs> and I discovered this morning at a, another session that she's married to the uh, remarkable and handsome playwright, George Brand. <laughs> who, who knew? So, so that's, our, that's our team today. These uh, artistic uh, leaders have, um, as I said, uh, been handed the task of talking about game change, and uh, uh, I, I guess, I guess we'll, 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 we'll start with, uh, with Michael Kahn. Uh, uh, just to, he told just, me I wouldn't start. No, but, no I changed my mind. The only but, lie I've heard in the entire time. <laughs> uh, I think your arrival at the Shakespeare Theater was a game changer in itself. I mean, the, the Folger was in trouble at that time, and you are, uh, arrived into a city that was about to close its only classical theater, is that right? Yeah, it was, it was closing. Uh, what had happened, it's a quick, quick story. It just was, the people who were running it, which were university people, didn't want to pay for it anymore, and so it was going to close. And so there was a community that wanted to keep it open, uh, and they brought me down to talk. I, I had decided I didn't want to be an artistic director at the local time of Dunn Rapids. Didn't want to look at a budget, didn't want to look at a program, didn't want to look at development, I didn't want to do any of it. And 
the idea, though, of working in an intimate place, which I'd never had the opportunity to do in the other jobs I had, interested me. And so I, I took the job, thinking it was a short job, but, but, <laughs> but also I, I said very clearly to the board, I was very flattered and honored to be asked, but they should know that I was not interested in saving a space or saving a building that I didn't think there was any need to have a classical theater unless there were the resources of the artists to be able to do the best work they could do. And that if we couldn't do that, uh, I didn't see why it should be there. Uh, and that was a good act, uh, attitude for me to have because I had left a theater five years previously where in order to save it, uh, I did things that I didn't believe in. Like plays I didn't believe in, co-productions I didn't believe in, a microphone I need. <laughs> I can't repeat any of that, so I hope that got something. <laughs> uh, and so I swore to myself that I would never do that again. Uh, and I guess I'm a, I guess I'm here because I, I'm, a, you know, I've been doing this all my life, and I'm a good example of how you can actually have an exciting and fulfilling and overly dramatic, crisis-ridden, <laughs> thrilling existence if you stick it out, and. Mm -hmm continually feel that your job is not to make a success, whatever that means. I thought the discussion yesterday about what success meant was quite valuable. But whether you and the people you were working with were doing the best work you knew how and find a way to connect that to the community you were in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. That's not the answer to your question, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Let's, let's, let's go to you, Nigel. Uh, you, I, I wanted, want you to t talk about, a little bit about the uh, Zimmerman Verdict project that you've done. This is a very different kind of theater than the classical theater Michael's talking about. And this is just to emphasize the incredible diversity. We've got a wild diversity of kind of theaters here. And you're, you're coming to the Flea, which is a, I mean, the Zimmerman project he'll tell you, but it was almost like pop-up theater in immediate response to what's on the news. Uh, how, is that going to work for you in a theater like The Flea, which is a more structured situation? Absolutely. It is? <laughs> Good. It's well, got to work. Tell it's us It's got to work, because we, uh, we have to do the work that needs to be done in, in the moment. Uh, and there's a, you know, there's a, as a new play developer, there's an intrinsic value to making and reflecting and creating and stepping back, much like the sculptor's process, in order to get to a play that resonates, that will become a part of the canon, that will be produced multiple times around the country. Uh, but sometimes we have to put down that work uh, and do what our country, what our neighbors are asking from us. Uh, you know, the, uh, the organization you talk about, Willing Participant, uh, came out of a need that me and my collaborators were finding that we couldn't uh, make work that was aesthetically pleasing uh, in a quick, a quick enough way uh, to hit the pulse of society. Uh, and so what we did is we, we tried to simplify the process um, as much as possible and to act as quickly as possible. So I'll use the last several days as, as an example. You know, on Wednesday night, uh, there was a, an atrocious massacre in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and uh, same thing happened when the... Uh, the verdict for George Zimmerman came out. That was a disaster, it was, uh, and many of us felt it as a massacre. Uh, and so, so this happens. And so you know, we pick up our bat phones, and uh, I text with the other ringleaders and say, hey, we've got to make something right now. Uh, this is at the top and forefront of all of our minds. We as artists need to be part of the dialogue. Uh, and so we then craft an email. We send it out to our uh, constituents. We, b we believe highly that the performance begins at the moment of invitation for all of those folks who are our marketing and our wonderful marketing and producing folks out there. Uh, the very first time you tell the story to someone else uh, is the beginning of the performance. 
So we sit and we craft that first email, uh, and we send it out to our constituents. We post it on Facebook and all of our networks. We might pick up the phone for those people who aren't using email, and we say, come and meet with us. Okay, we've got a framework for facilitating conversations that will lead to an artistic response. We spend no more than four hours together in a room. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. we will be at the Flea Theater. This is how the Flea serves its role in this mission. Uh, and we will meet in one of the theaters. We will talk about what's fucked up, uh, what is this crazy shit going on around us, and we will start to think as activists and as artists, thank you Odessa Jones for the great leadership uh, and modeling, uh, and we, and, uh, yes. Um, so we'll spend that four hours really wrestling with the issues. My job as one of the ringleaders is to bring in the materials and to bring in guidance that will allow us to dream uh, and to dream poetically uh, as well as socially. Uh, and then after that four uh, hours, we'll have come to some thesis you know, around the uh, Zimmerman verdict. It was that the lives of black men in this nation are not being respected. And we will have come to uh, some symbology that works around that thesis. So we thought uh, at that moment in our history, it was about the hoodie. Uh, and uh, it was about us as a nation all putting, uh, all, all taking that on and saying, uh, we acknowledge and, ha and are affected by um, the uh, atrocities that happen around us. So the ringleader step back after the meeting and then create uh, a form, a container. Uh, for uh, that piece, for Trayvon. Uh, the form was a procession into Times Square. Uh, so we, and w once we've built this, we send out another email, join us for the response. So join us uh, you know, a couple blocks away from Times Square so the police don't know what we're doing just yet. Uh, we meet there, bring a hoodie, bring two, because someone might not have one. We will all put on this symbol. Uh, and then one of the things that I think is uh, most Im important about our role as civic activists as theater, because when we create on our stages and inside rooms, we want to create a whole event uh, that our, um, you know, our audience is responding to and engaging in. Uh, but w when we're in a more a uh, activist role, uh, our job is to make sure that there's room for multiple perspectives and multiple voices. Uh, so we created a, a, an action, a response, uh, that led us in procession to Times Square. We formed a line. This is all in silence. We're using the poetry of the body in this piece. We have our hoodies on. Uh, we line up and we take a pose. And, and so the prompt for the pose is uh, show a pose to the passersby that says respect the bodies and lives of young black men. Now the individual participants in this get to choose what that pose is. This is where their voice enters in the piece. We hold that pose for a, mo a minute. We walk across to the other side of Times Square. There's a line, there's a mass of bodies. Take a new pose. We do this moving back and forth for 35 minutes. This is a direct action, a direct intervention. It's a poetic intervention. Uh, but what's, I think, really exciting for us as theater makers and performance makers uh, is that our, our audience will be wherever we are. If we make thrilling, important, work that is charged with the issues that we're all wrestling with, they will stop. You know, one of the things we consider in this model is what time of day does it happen? It doesn't have to be at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. So we said 10.45, the Broadway shows are coming out, so we'll get this wonderful cross-section of America. Um, yeah, that's a long, well, I'm, good. I'm, well, stop. I'm done that's talking. Good. But explain, <laughs> explain how, the, uh, how, how the flea is organized differently than, right. than other things. Oh yeah, so the flea, so which is work. great, is we have this resident company. We have this resident company of young performers who are pre-professionals, and my job is to, uh, it's twofold. One, it's to give them work that's gonna challenge them, uh, and that's gonna display their excellent young artistry, and to invite in professionals uh, and, um, directors and uh, casting directors who are going to cast them and make sure they don't need to volunteer at the flea anymore. I was just mm -hmm. talking with uh, Mr. Khan backstage, you know, and uh, my producing director and I were having a conversation the other day, and you know, if one of these young actors is still in our institution in two years, we've not done our job. Uh, and so, uh, so half of my job is getting them out into the field. Mm -hmm. The other half of my job is developing their voice as artists. Uh, and so I think that the kind of work that I've done throughout my career, which is not wait for an institution or not wait for a play to suddenly get produced, but to actually say, all right, this thing has to happen now, uh, is one of the things I have to offer to these mm -hmm. young artists. Uh, and so the flea 
uh, is a site, is a site and is an opportunity um, to uh, let them be a part of this practice. Great. Well, that's one kind of uh, company. Now, Greg Boyd can talk about, uh, I learned talking to him the other day that he joined ACT, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, at the age of 16. And uh, they had a company of 42 actors at that time. Has uh, this imprint of the resident company idea uh, been a game changer for you in your uh, time? Yeah, it certainly changed my life. In the late 60s, Bill Ball, the great Bill Ball, brought uh, his company, ACT, out to San Francisco, where I grew up. The idea of seeing 42 actors doing 16 plays in a season 11 in rep, I said, this is what it is, as far as I'm concerned. And then something happened that changed that in this early on. In the midst of all that work, Bill found the time to let the Geary Theater be the host for the world tour of the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Midsummer Night's Dream, 1972, directed by Peter Brook. I'm not alone in claiming that production as a life-changing experience, it was, but not for the reasons that I think everybody who knows it or has read about it or looked at the pictures might think. It was a clash of company cultures. Here was the Royal Shakespeare Company, trained in a certain sort of way, um, living in a room now or in a place now where a bunch of American actors who were trying to forge an American style of acting that wasn't based on a kind of British classicism, wasn't based on a methody kind of mumbly, whatever the cliches are, and finding something else. Because Bill would do a wide variety of plays. You know, Tartuffe followed by six characters, followed by a new play. If you look at the pictures of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'm sure many of you have seen those pictures, what you see are the wonderful design by Sally Jacobs, the bright costumes, the white box set, all of that. But what was important about the production was the way it sounded, not the way it looked. I had never seen actors deliver a, any kind of text so fast, so clearly, and with such uh, sexual charisma. It was the sexiest sounding play I have ever seen <laughs> in my life. And Richard Peasley's music contributed to that. So they were there for three weeks, the RRC. And we had this kind of clash of company cultures between the ACT actors, all of whom I admired and looked up to and loved, and these Brits, well, not all Brits, or not all what we think of as old Vicky kind of Brits. Because Brooke was already on the way to create the most multicultural theater company that he later, of course, developed more deeply in Paris and elsewhere. And these actors who had home, been home in, in Stratford and in London were now on this world tour, very long world tour, great American cities, great world cities, and were coming up, and were, the questions they asked to the ACT actors were, what is it like to be an actor here, in this place. And that's what I began to develop, what a company is. The, the term, the acronym that a lot of us are familiar with is LORT, L-O-R-T. But that doesn't mean League of Regional Theaters or League of Repertory Theaters even, it means League of Residence Theaters. And it means simply, or what I learned, I thought simply, was that the artists live in the community for whom they perform. Very simple. I felt guilty, sorry. I felt guilty today when we were all talking about how long it's been since we've been to a TCG conference. Because for some of us, it's been in the double digits. And I didn't want to say why earlier. I'll say why now, and sorry, just to take the moment to do it. It's because I got really upset the last time I was here. Because I heard someone describe Peter Zeisler talking about the founding of TCG. And one of the sentences he used was, before 1961, it was impossible to think that a theater artist could have a life in Providence, or Louisville, or Minneapolis, or San Francisco, or Houston. And I don't know how good the institutions have been doing at putting artists at the center of the work. You would never see a modern dance company 
change over its entire roster of dancers between concerts, or a symphony hire new musicians for the next concert, or a ballet company. An actor said to me, a traveling actor said to me, you know, all this talk about artistic home, artistic home, what does that mean? Well, for a home to have a set of siblings for eight weeks and then another set of siblings for eight weeks, it's not a home, it's a halfway house. <laughs> So it got in my blood early. I'm obsessed with this idea of company. We do a lot of plays at the alley, probably way too many. But there are 17 actors that are with us all the time. They don't do every play, they do some of the plays, and then other people come in and do other plays. And then there's a mix in some productions, influenced by the RSC and ACT living together at that time. And that's just the way I think it works. So I don't know if it's a game change. That's what the game was. And I think we need to get back to that. Thank you. Laura, talk about what game change means for you here in Cleveland. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I feel like um, we're just in the middle of so many game changes here in Cleveland. And I just want to acknowledge and thank all of you for coming to Cleveland and being a part of this incredible game that we've had here the past three days, for really coming in, um, meeting us. And I think our councilman made it pretty clear. Um, but you being here in our city matters. And it matters deeply to our theater community, who I'm so glad that we've, we've gotten to um, connect uh, with all of you. And I think your being here um, will also change the future of our community here in some ways. And we hope that, that what you, uh, for those of you who aren't here, that your being here will change your future going forward too. Um, I mean that, I think, you know, I, I, I just wanna share with my fellow uh, colleagues here in Cleveland and uh, I hope you have this, a similar story of how many people have come up and said, Cleveland is amazing. <laughs> Cleveland is, I am having such a, I didn't know. Cleveland is amazing. And I hope that a game change that will come from this is that you'll take um, those stories back um, and with the um, young people who uh, you work with, that Cleveland becomes uh, on the, their radar. Um, Oscar Eustis was on stage uh, yesterday and he was talking about Bohemia. He just sort of briefly said that idea about Bohemia, that time where you get to explore, sort of really find yourself as an artist. And I was fortunate enough as a young artist to have that in Chicago. And I'm so proud that I see that happening here in Cleveland. Um, so I, I wanna put that out. Um, and then just to switch gears just a little bit, because I feel like I kind of have to. Um, it's been an amazing game-changing time for Cleveland Playhouse. Um, I was lucky enough to arrive at a time of tremendous change, um, founded in 1915. Um, when I arrived in 2010, that was the last year in what had been our home for over 88 years. Um, so in the five years uh, since 2010, um, our organization um, has geographically moved, our business model has changed, our collaborative, um, uh, some of our collaborative practices have changed. I hope that um, our partnering and our role in the community is beginning to evolve and change and open. Um, yeah, and it's, it's uh, and then of course there, there's uh, been uh, artistic change, huge change in our education programs. Um, and I'll, I'll stop the Cleveland Playhouse commercial <laughs> right now for a second. But I just want to say that um, 
when I was looking at Cleveland in 2010 and to see America's first regional theater going, saying, you know what, if we want to survive, if we want to make work for another century, we have to make this tremendous change, this big game change. Um, we have, uh, and I feel now at the end of five years going into our centennial season, we are just now um, beginning to really start the important work, the important change. And I know that I have been so moved at this conference. And I will, <laughs> you know, um, the work uh, that's being done and making that pledge that we did in the last session, so powerful. And so I just want to thank you. Mina, that, that leaves you. Uh, uh, as I said, you've made the rounds in, in, the, in San Francisco, uh, working at the ground floor project at Berkeley Rep and Shotgun Players and so forth. How's, uh, how's your leadership of this new company going to, going to uh, work? How's it, what's the watchword for you? Well, um, I first want to acknowledge all the ancestors and all of the great leaders on whom you know, on whose shoulders we stand, on whose shoulders I stand. Um, and it leads me to think about the first mentor and great leader that I had a chance to work with at Berkeley Rep for the last six years. When I started my artistic fellowship there six years ago, one of the first things he said was, what is your worldview? Because that is going to inform everything you make and for whom you make it. And I took that, you know, I mean, Tony, he'll, and he'll state this, he's an old hippie. He grew up in the 60s and he was, you know, he was reared then. And for him, the, the regional theater movement was about creating a home for artists locally. And it was about um, really separating this idea of commercialism or capitalism from the theater. And so I had the great pleasure of working side by side with him in the creation of a new program called The Ground Floor at Berkeley Rep. Uh, it's, I got to start it with three other um, fantastic leaders, uh, Madeline Oldham, uh, Megan Pressman, Karina, Fiorenza Ingersoll, myself, and many others. Um, and it was about following the first creative impulse of that revolution. And it was about creating a space for over 100 artists for anywhere from 13 to 18 new plays in development at any point in their process, from just an idea to a completed script. And the space that we created was a space for failure to be okay, for that to be all right, for it not to be connected to any kind of product, um, and that if somebody was to ask for anything, for any kind of design element for a collaborator in the moment of creation, we would provide that for them. We created this incredible program where I learned how much it meant from the simple thing of handing a prop to you know, a, a, a new play development room where they were like trying to figure out how a specific puppet worked to um, getting singers for a new musical. I mean, it was the entire range of that. And I carry now with me that idea of creating a safe space, the idea of an artistic home truly, into my new home, which is Crowded Fire. And the timing is really uh, quite perfect for, I think, both of us. Um, because what Marissa Wolf, my predecessor and artistic director, had built with Tiffany Cothran before I arrived is a space where we're looking at um, championing culturally diverse voices, um, provocative voices, um, and, and really the idea of developing a canon for the future, for our current generation, and, and to make a space, to forcefully make and deliberately make a space where that work can go at its own pace, 
where the artist is the center of every question that is brought forward and that the organization is in existence for those artists and rests upon also the shoulders of our resident artist company and our staff and our board and that there's a sense of entrepreneurship and innovation that hopefully we can design that is separate from this more capitalist reality that we live in. Um, because ultimately the thing that changes us, the genetics that need to evolve, is for us to step away from that while still understanding, of course, fiscal responsibility. I'm not saying throw that out the window. But, um, <laughs> to really, you know, I feel like that is my torch that I carry from all of you into the future, that it is a space for risk, it is a space for everyone, and it is a space for art that is going to reflect our humanity. So, wish me luck. <laughs> Well, um, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, go for it. Sure, I'll go for it. Uh, so one of the things that comes up is, uh, a, a lot is that protecting the risk and the failure and the space for the artist to do the work they need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and from Diane's lovely introduction of Ms. Jones uh, to the conversation we've been having up here, around our role as activists, as game changers in our communities, uh, as, the, the act, uh, as the artists who are going to like, light the fire. Um, you know, I, I, find, I found myself throughout this, cha uh, this challenge, this, <laughs> I literally think of it as a challenge, through this conference, uh, finding myself, <laughs> this conference has been a challenge, it's been challenging me to, thi to think about where are our resources going? You know, I, I was up at the Ideas Fest in uh, New Haven recently, and uh, there was a whole section sort of uh, roped off. It had special back covers. It had a, two giant signs that said, these are our proud donors. And so they got the, the oligarch, oligarchy got the prime locations in, the, in there, and everyone got to look and see these really wonderful people. And I think that part of our job as, uh, as artist leaders while being fiscally responsible, is to say to those people who fund us is what you get, instead of that prime location, you actually get to sit at the back and look at the people you got to fund to sit in those prime locations. Yeah. So yeah, so how do we have that conversation? How do we engage in that? And that the, that the value is in that you're helping the whole community experience. I, 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 I've thought about this recently, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I, I this, uh, we just done a play that, you know, probably the board hates. Oh, Use I'm the sorry. mic. Yeah. We've just done a play that probably the board hates, you know, but I'll get away with it because I've been there so long. <laughs> 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 but the truth is, is that that's not a good answer. Mm. And, it, and, and, and it came up the other day with the staff, and I thought, why don't I, uh, you know, we talked to the staff lab, but I, I thought this is a complicated issue for the staff, this play. So why don't they come and talk to, to me afterwards? And we had a lunch, and I was surprised. You know, there was two or three people from each department. And, and I, I said, well, so let's talk about the production. And, uh, and I wouldn't let the dramaturg talk to explain it. Yeah. I, I, I just said, you just talk. And, Whatever you say is okay. As a matter of fact, it's actually important. I, I want to hear it. We all want to hear it and discuss it. So somebody, so one of the young women said, uh, well, I didn't like it. You know, I don't like it is not an answer for anything. Uh, that's not enough. I mean, we're used to it always on Yelp and everything. I don't like it. I hate yes. it. Yes. it. It's not an answer, and it, it, it doesn't enrich anybody who says that. So I said, well, let's go further. He said, well, I, I liked it until this happened. And I said, okay, I think that was a, a large theatrical moment that could indeed make you very uncomfortable, but you said you, you cut out when that happened. And I said, well, why was that? And she said, well, I just, I, I couldn't deal with it. I said, well, okay, why do you think it was there? 
you know, the teacher responsible piece, but why was it there? And as she began to think that, and other people in the room started talking about why it was, and, and when it was over, we never got very far past that moment in the play, it's been an hour, as to they began to think past this yes or no criticism mm. to some deeper understanding perhaps of trying to understand the work in context of the work and not just in context of their own. Yeah. So I thought this has to be done with the board mm. because the board, who, and I, you know, Lord love them, they're a pretty damn good board, and I've known the other kind. Uh, <laughs> uh, I thought, we never get a chance, so of course we put their names on chairs, right. because we never really give ourselves a chance to, uh, t well, some of us do, but not enough chance to <laughs> force them to be involved in the art, yeah. you know, and maybe this question of really, let's just, Talk about something that happened that you objected to or something is a way of encouraging a different kind of dialogue and a different kind of uh, immersion in the art. And so they, they will, because I think that finally they have to have pleasure in something other than just the fact that they've all meet, met each other in different corporations. So uh, th th that's one response. What I hear too is, why are we afraid, I know we are, but why are we afraid of risky or edgy work? But we shouldn't be. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything worthwhile, I mean, nothing worthwhile is embarked on without fear. So I, I hope for myself that I'm scared half to death all the time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, what I've found, when you do difficult work or work that people object to for whatever reason they object to it, I'm sorry to sing this song again, but in, in tough plays, it's the actors in the company who have helped the audience through that. I've seen those actors. I own those actors. I've seen them in that Shakespeare play or that Arthur Miller play or whatever. And now they're in this play that I don't quite understand and I'm not at all sure that I like. But they're there to sort of help an audience, or they can be, sort of there to help an audience into difficult or challenging work. And that's something I think well, no, I'll go there. No, no, no. no. Oh. All right, if you want to. <laughs> if you want your audience to own your theater company, then they have to have that sense of proprietorship. Thick or thin, fair weather or foul, hated it, loved it, like your ball team, you know? So they're like the Astros, or as I like to call them, the Disastros. We're having a great season this year. <laughs> but they're owned somehow by the, and they can say to the actors afterwards, you know, I don't know why he or they or you picked that. But I loved you in this. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a mitigating factor when they own the artists somehow. We did two plays, two new plays by Rajiv Joseph that, that were, uh, <laughs> From Cleveland, <laughs> that were that were tough on a lot of people in the audience, um, and then I asked Rajiv to because he had been around a lot, he had seen the company actors. They weren't in the first two plays that we did with him, but he had seen the actors. And then I said, write a play for them. So he has, and it's a fantastic, powerful piece of work. And I know, first of all, the audience, even though they saw the first two things and maybe didn't, you know, weren't so comfortable with some of it, they own him now. And they look forward to the next Rajiv Joseph play, even though it was sort of an uncomfortable event twice before. And it's gonna be, I think, a, the thing to have, to invite the writer into the company and to let the difficult work be, uh, what's the word? Reach, to, uh, hey, let me take you by the hand into something that's a little bit more challenging than you might be used to. I'm not saying it very well, but there you go. No, you did. Uh, Laura, you, you are um, uh, pioneering some education work that you wanted to talk about today. Tell, tell us about that. Sure. Um, Cleveland Playhouse has been 
a, a lead agency in uh, the United Way uh, wraparound strategy in, in um, our community. And yes, there was a, there was a um, session on this earlier today, um, but I think that that has been um, the, the uh, part, of, part of the game change at Cleveland Playhouse is really to go look at our core values and say, how are we putting those in action? And what do we mean when we say we're, we're serving the community? And what, what does that uh, look like for us? And I know this is a, a, a question that, that I, would, I would think that, that many, many people are, are, are having. Um, and thinking, for a long time, the thinking had been very broad. You know, how many students are we reaching? You know, there, and of course, that's so important because that's, you know, sometimes that one touch, that may be their one touch with theater, so we have to go broad. But really looking at where we want to go deep. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to our Director of Education, Pamela Di Pasquale. Um, she, she really uh, has been the pioneer uh, behind this and being a part of it. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Nina Domang, Nathan Lilly, and Jocelyn Prince, who are the people who are embedded in those three schools. So I'm, I, should, I should explain a little better, actually, what I'd really love is for, to let to have them explain it to you. But um, so, so those, uh, those uh, three folks who I just mentioned, they are every day in the schools. They are, um, they are of course, compassionate theater art artists who are interested in remaking education. Um, they are in the schools as a theater artist. They are there also to connect the students with social services. They are running summer camps uh, at those schools that are, um, and their commitment is to the, 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 the schools, the communities the schools are in, um, the caregivers, um, and they're, they're creating a um, summer camps where there haven't been summer camps before, and then also coordinating all of the social services needed to support that. So that means lunch at the camps. Um, that means, you know, in, in the winter, I, I, uh, you know, Jocelyn, uh, and Nathan telling stories about, you know, handing out more gloves, handing, needing more coats, um, getting more food bags, because there's new, more food bags. And um, so Cleveland Playhouse has been very fortunate that we can align with the United Way to do this work that expands, um, well, I shouldn't say expand, that the work that we have a responsibility to, uh, to, to do in our community. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, that idea of, of how, how can we continue to go deeper and deeper, because that's our responsibility. Let's, let's take questions from you guys. Uh, we have microphone people, I believe. And uh, uh, here's, who wants to talk to these artistic directors? <laughs> Identify yourselves before you Hi there, start. I am Sunmi Shoman. I'm an independent artist and also a Fox Fellow with Move Performing Arts um, in Minneapolis. Um, my question is, from this conference, what are each of your commitments, one thing that you're going to change this year? Hmm. Yep. One thing. Um, this is my first conference, and I get to be on stage here in front of all of you at my first conference. Um, I've been... <laughs> I'm honored, and um, it's been thrilling. It was completely unexpected, and um, I'm so inspired to not always consider that I'm just looking for mentors for myself as I create space for for the work and for diverse voices, um, but also to look at those who are coming into our field, um, that every opportunity that I can um, is to make space for, th for the people who are coming after us, because that is the only way that we will continue to affect change. Um, in terms of the work that Crowded Fire is doing, um, what I love about it and I will continue to do is to uh, walk the talk or do the work 
Um, since 2009, we have done 100% of diverse work, either people of color, women, or um, queer identifying um, playwrights. And I'm going to continue that work and then build more space for that work to grow so that it can continue to then um, feed the rest of our community in San Francisco and hopefully nationally. Um, I, uh, I had made a commitment to myself for the next three years to the theater to bring uh, directors, quite young directors who had worked in small theaters but had a passion for a certain kind of material uh, to our theater to work uh, as directors on, on, on the big stage. I was given that opportunity by Joe Papp and uh, when I was quite young and I, it meant a great deal to me. And I committed myself to a, a, a group of directors. But what I've come to realize and through this conference and other conversations is that I have to help the staff of the theater understand different ways of working by different artists. And that uh, while, I, while I felt very good about welcoming people in, as we start this, the complications that often come up when somebody wants it a different way and people have not used to that. It's my job to try to help the culture of the theater be, make it possible for those artists to work. And that's a lot bigger. <laughs> and that's just a lot bigger than say, come on in. So uh, I've learned that. Uh, and I, I can't wait to go back and start. Is that a, oh, we do have one. I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to open a new theater building. We've been off site for the past season. So we go back and we get it back in August. We're all thrilled about that. It's not just a new theater building. It transforms everything about the way we've been doing the work for a long time. It's been hard in the past to really do a new play by someone who, so we have two theaters, a 300 seat theater and an 800 seat theater. It's very hard to put a new play on the, in the 800 seat theater in a subscription series that has to have 36 performances if that play is not by Edward Albee or Tony Kushner or Teresa Rebe. So the idea is to offer the new plays and the playwrights who work with the company the opportunity to use the big stage if they want it and break the tyranny of the calendar. Instead of doing 36 performances, we do 10. Take it off, put it back in a rehearsal. A couple of weeks later, come back. Do it again. Take it off. It's really scary. <laughs> because, is Dean here? It's really scary because <laughs> you're taking the subscription model and you're sort of twisting it. But I think they'll come with us. I think they will. And you get to offer them, the writer, all the resources that you have, if they want to use that, if they want 20 characters, if they want the big stage, then let them use it. However, like what Michael just said, it's, I think, and this is what I've learned over the past couple of days, it's going to be incumbent on all of us who try to lead at the Alley Theater to explain to the staff a new way of working. They come back to a new building with a lot of things that we couldn't do before, but that's only there in order to facilitate this way of working and making new plays much more part of the company repertoire at the theater that I work at. Uh, I've just been four weeks on the job, so <laughs> everything feels like a change. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I, I came into a culture where the uh, the staff really just wanted me, wanted me to go into my office and and then uh, uh, come out with ideas and things for them to do. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, you know, as a, uh, my, my directing training is very much about having a very clear vision and, and galvanizing uh, those folks towards that. But um, yesterday I was in the 20, leading for 20, leadership for 2042, uh, and I realized that I was missing an opportunity 
uh, to have a deeper engagement with some of my staff members. You know, I have an audience engagement uh, person, Ellen, uh, uh, who is phenomenal, and she's a dramaturg and trained as a dramaturg. And, you know, and so as soon as I heard that, I, I started throwing plays over to her and, and get her feedback. But I, I now know that actually I, I need to go back and more deeply investigate everyone on the staff uh, and make sure that we're all uh, have ownership over the seasons that are being planned. Can I just jump in on that because it's really, you, what you said is a clear way of saying what was bungled in my thinking. I, I used to think, I used to think that the definition of a director was watching real people fuck up your dreams, you know. That that's <laughs> <laughs> Then I learned, then I learned a, a, a different kind of, a different kind of way of thinking about it from Brooke in, the, in his book, in which he says, a director is a guide at night that does not know the way. Mm. But so many people are dependent on guidance that they look towards that. But it can't go without saying in this centenary year of Orson Welles, his definition of a director, which is the person who presides over accidents. <laughs> You've helped me, my friend. <laughs> Laura. Yeah, um, you know, I, I appreciate your question very much. And um, my book is full <laughs> of, of um, commitments and uh, but I feel like before, I, I'm just going to be very honest, before I can sort of state that, that honestly, I feel like these past three days have made me think in profoundly different ways. Um, so I, what I can say right now is that I, I am committing to investigating and inquiring how I can continue to um, understand and do the mission, the mission of, the, of our theater. Well, folks, that, that was one long question, but they're telling me that our time is up. So I want to thank these artistic directors for a wonderful conversation. can go. <laughs> Thank you. You can go. Oh, wait, are you going to say something about DC? I, I was supposed to ask Michael Kahn one extra question that I forgot, which is to talk about yeah, next right. year in DC, okay. right? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave the stage no, and wait, he'll tell Jim, you about that. You're not going I'm anywhere. not going anywhere, okay. okay. <laughs> so I didn't answer his first question because he surprised me, but actually, this is a, 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 a thing about DC. Uh, when I got there 100 years ago, there were five theaters. Uh, two of them were about to close. And uh, over the years, through a lot of work and connection with the community and all kinds of uh, uh, really innovative ideas about, a, about what to do and how to do it and with whom, uh, there are now 60 theaters in Washington, DC. And, uh, and one of the really interesting things is that in many ways, those theaters are co collaborate with each other. And although you, the, the, it, you won't be there, but next fall, in September and October, every theater in Washington, D.C. is going to premiere for their first play of the season or second play of the season, a new play by a woman playwright. So that also means you're going to get 50 new plays on your desk next year of dram <laughs> dramaturg. But we're very pleased to announce that next year's uh, TCG conference will be in Washington, D.C. <laughs> All right, we're excited about that.
And one more thing, a lot of those 50 theaters will be having plays, and we hope you'll come to see them. Thank you, Michael. We're so excited about that. So before we leave, we have one more visionary game changer to honor. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can you move over a seat or two for me? Sure, honey. <laughs> this okay? Center stage, please. When Peter... When Peter Zeisler and Lindy Zesch looked to hire an editor for TCG's newsletter in 1982, they may not have realized they were bringing on someone who would transform the story of our field forever. You see, there hadn't been a general circulation magazine covering the theater field in decades, and so in 1984, American theater was born. Under Jim's leadership as editor-in-chief, American theater has published thousands of articles, and over 150 full-length plays. He has transformed that little theater newsletter into an award-winning champion of theater and arts journalism with a print readership of over 50,000 and a new online version garnering over 100,000 page views a month. Many leaders in the field have spoken movingly about the first time they were featured in American theater, and under Jim's restless <laughs> commitment, to truly reflecting our diverse, our diverse field, the magazine has helped launch careers by championing em emerging artists and young companies. He also made sure to honor the voices of our veteran leaders and artists in a culture obsessed with the new hot thing. While he may be retiring from running the magazine, we won't let him escape completely. He'll continue to write for AT. If theater holds the mirror up to nature, Jim's American theater has given us our own reflection, showing us a diverse and evolving field made whole by our differences. Jim, words are not enough to properly thank a man of such eloquence, so we're going to turn to music from a fellow lover of New Orleans, Lisa Mount. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> Oh, 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 yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. You know the end is near when they invite out the consultant with a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> some pictures okay, okay. Hey, Jim, you're kind of a saint. And this is a sing-along, y'all. You'll get the chorus fairly quickly. It's not hard. When Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. <laughs> when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. He's tried to be completely fair. That must be why he lost his hair. Oh, Lord, I'm going to emulate that number when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. Oh, who will know where the commas go? Or scare people by sleeping on the floor. We will love all the dogs in that number when Jim O'Quinn goes marching oh, out. Sing the chorus with me when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. When Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. He's been around since who knows when, outlasting Peter, John, and Ben. But Teresa is still in that number, and Terry Nemeth and Amelia too, when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. Goes marching out, when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. I want to be in that number when Jim O'Quinn goes marching out. <laughs> Thanks. That's great. Thank you very much. She's amazing. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> We will now allow the defendant a few moments to rebut. 
Mr. O'Quinn, if you would like to rebut those statements, you would be welcome. <laughs> Oh, sit down. The, uh, you know, when we had the 25th anniversary party of American Theater Magazine, the uh, TCG, staff, TCG staff surprised me with a present. Uh, and they didn't tell me what it was until the event itself, and the present was Taylor Mac. You know, I, I had my own drag queen for a day. It was amazing. Can you, can you beat that? But, uh, but this, is, this, is, uh, this is lovely. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, I, I appreciate it all. Um, and, uh, and the magazine is in great hands. I'm absolutely delighted that Rob Kent has, uh, has become my successor. And we'll be working together on the September and October issues, and, uh, and uh, uh, some great things are in store. And so thank you all for, for that ovation. We have a tradition at TCG of giving outgoing board members a copy of uh, the American Theatre Magazine cover with their picture on it. And so what we have for you, Jim, is your very own American Theatre cover. <laughs> Real but Real look, I'm wearing Sam Shepard's hat, <laughs> all right? Yeah, but, and this uh, is a brilliantly photoshopped uh, version of the first, <laughs> the very first issue of American Theater with Sam Shepard on the cover. Thank you, Kitty Suen, for making that happen. The fabulous Kitty Suen. Thank you, guys. Okay. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> so, um, it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> We've come to the end of our three plus days together. We've danced with pink elephants and dined with donut trucks. We've laughed with Baratunde and cried with Dave. We've taken selfies with chandeliers and played pretend beer pong on parking decks. And we've had so much fun that the Cleveland Host Committee is founding a real estate company to house all the conference attendees who plan to move to Cleveland now. <laughs> But before we go back to our desks and our overflowing inboxes, I want to acknowledge something we heard over and over again. Stories matter. The stories we tell matter, and how we tell them matters, and who gets to tell them matters. Not in some abstract theoretical way, but in how we live together, and how, the truths we, <coughs> how we live together and the truths we dare tell. And maybe they matter even more in theater because the way we tell stories is through human beings human bodies alive together in the same place and time. And just as we know that the consequences of our culture stories of hate and exclusion have been inflicted upon human bodies, so we must believe that the healing we need, the liberation we long for, the justice for which we fight must be brought about by stories of love and inclusion told by human bodies alive together in the same place and time. And this matters even more now because of so many acts of hate, such as what happened this week in Charleston. Our time together now ends, but the work continues. Let's please keep in touch with each other and hold each other accountable for the promises we've made here. And let's be allies for one another and lift each other up when we call out for help. And Mark your calendars now to join us in 2016 with Michael Kahn and everyone in Washington, D.C. And thank you. We'll see you across the street for a party.